Welcome to the interview room. Today's show is going to take you back to, quite frankly, one of the worst cases I think South Carolina has ever seen. The date was October 25th, 1994, at this lake. Come with me, I'll show you what we're talking about. I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. So here we are, that October fateful day. A mom with two children, a three-year-old and a 14-month-old strapped in their car seats in the back of their vehicle. Mom gets out of the car, and at the time, this was a very steep boat ramp. You can see it, you can still see the concrete here that's left over. Mom jumps out of the vehicle and that car goes down this steep incline, which you can see here, gains enough momentum to where the vehicle is gaining enough speed to hit this water. It initially goes out about 30 feet, floats another 30 feet, or yeah, about 30 feet, they said, and then subsequently sinks. But here, not only is that horrifying to be thinking about and terrible. I can't even comprehend it. But she's standing right here watching the whole thing go down. So the obvious question at this point is, what does she do next? Well, the alibi has to begin. I want to say to my babies <laughs> that your mama loves you so much and your daddy, these whole families love you so much. <laughs> And you guys have got to be strong because you are, we, 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 I just know, I just feel in my heart that you're okay, but you got to take care of each other. And your mom and dad are going to be right here waiting on you when you get home. It hurts to know that, um, that I would be accused or even thought that I would ever do anything to harm my children. As a mother, it's only a natural instinct to protect your children from any harm. And the hardest part of this whole ordeal is not knowing if your children are getting what they need to survive. And um, it, it, it hurts, it hurts real bad. So the alibi begins. In 1994, this building right behind me was actually the original Walmart here in Union. But the building's not as important as what she started to tell investigators. And that's, that's gonna deal with the parking lot here. Susan reports that she's in her car in the parking lot and a black male shows up armed with a gun and carjacks the two children in the vehicle and flees. Her alibi then changes. She then tells the investigators, well, I wasn't really at the Walmart. I was actually driving around town. And then she comes to a red light and another black male is introduced into the story who randomly jumps into her car, pulls her out and then takes the children. You know, I find it ironic that through this tragedy, this building where the first alibi story started, i.e. the lies, has now been designated as a future church. In another church, in this small room, Susan Smith gives a full written confession 
after nine days to the police investigators in the case that she killed her young boys. The news shocked the world. So right here over to the right is where Susan lived. Both she and her husband bought that house. The two little boys were there. And this would have been the road that she would have taken to the park. So let's take that drive together, shall we? So she would have come out of that driveway and she would have gone in this direction. And the drive that we're gonna take is gonna be about uh, almost 18 minutes. So think about that. She has 18 minutes with these two children strapped in the back seat of her car to contemplate and think through what she's going to do. Now I find it interesting that one of the first things she comes up with is a stoplight. Well, right down the street from her house is the first stoplight that we come to at a, at a stop sign. So is this the stoplight, quite frankly, that may have you know, kicked off the first thought process in her alibi, where she later interjects the black male? Now we know it's probably not the stoplight that ultimately she said it occurred at, but I find it ironic that right down the street from her house, less than a, you know, 500 yards, is the first light that you get to. So now we go down this road, and you can see this is a quite, you know, quaint little community. But what's going on in her mind is her two children, she knows she's headed to a park, John D. Long Park Lake, and she's going to end those two little lives. So she would get to this corner, turn left, and think through how she's going to commit the act. Let's go along on the journey, shall we? What do you think she was thinking? She's been asked many times, you know, what was in her mind. And of course, the psychi psychiatrists have said that, you know, she was mentally disturbed because of her sexual abuse as a child. And that could be, absolutely. But I think more importantly, she had already determined that the children were in the way of her relationship with her new boyfriend. And he didn't want kids in the relationship. So she's driving down this road knowing that she's going to take the lives of her two kids and at the same time pick up perhaps the support of her boyfriend. Because a week earlier, he had related to her that he did not want a family if they were going to be connected together. That's pretty interesting in of itself. So look around. Look around at the countryside. And then put yourself in the mind of the perpetrator. One of the things that we do as investigators is what we call suspectology. What was the suspect thinking? What was the behavioral analysis thought process that somebody can have their two children in the back seat of their vehicle and they're taking them to their final demise? You know, some people are just mentally disturbed. We get that piece. But then there are also others who are consciously deciding what they're going to do. A jury found that was the case in Susan Smith's case. So as I take you down this road and on this, jur on this journey, I want you to feel what a jury would have felt. I want you to sense what a jury would have sensed. I want you to feel and see 
what Susan would have seen. And I want you to sense what she would have sensed. But more importantly, I always want to remember that those two little victims in this horrific crime had no way of knowing what was ahead of them from their own mother. It's just horrible. So she comes to another stop sign here. I find this this is really a pivotal point if you think about this in, in criminal behavior. What does a stop sign represent? Stop. Think. What are you doing? Did she think that? Did she did she go through that thought process? It's interesting. There were a lot of opportunities to do it. No, she continues on the road. She's determined. Well, here we are. Another opportunity to think. So here we are, the last two miles. On this road, she is finalizing her thought process about how this is going to end for her and for her children. What I find interesting though, and I don't know if a lot of people are asking this question, is you know, this is quite a drive to get to this location. So there's a lot of thought process that's going into this. But what's interesting, and what I'm thinking about, is once the car goes in the water, there's got to be another piece of this puzzle that, they, that she's thought about in terms of who picks her up. How does she leave this location eight miles from her house? and gets back to start the charade and the story. I think the investigators started to look at all angles and thank goodness they did. So we're eight tenths of a mile to where the final turn goes. We're less than two minutes out Imagine what she's processing now. She knows what she's going to do. She's getting to the place where she understands that there's no turning around. The plan is in motion. And it's interesting, again, she comes to a yield sign. Are these like signs that she can think about? Stop, slow down. She has to. From here, she has to slow down. She has to look. She has to think. As we get up here, she then makes the fatal decision. That decision is in 700 feet. It's done. This was a conscious decision to drive down this road. Take those boys at the time into the boat ramp right here and end their lives. So this is the memorial for Michael and Alex, a three-year-old 
and a 14 month old. And this is the road their mother took with them strapped in the back seat to the boat ramp. Susan Smith has been arrested and will be charged with two counts of murder in connection with the deaths of her children, Michael, three, and Alexander, 14 months. Robert Smith, by means of drowning and said they died as a result thereof, in South Carolina versus Susan Smith, indicted for murder, and indicted for alleged Susan Smith did in Union County on or about October 25th, 1994. You know, I can't help but think about that nine days of a mother's just just pleading with the country for their uh, for her two children, knowing all along that those two children were not alive. It's sad to think at that time that she went in front of the public and did multiple press conferences cried on TV, blamed African-American males uh, for the abduction of her children. America's Most Wanted got involved. Investigators from all over the United States and quite frankly, people from all over the world were looking for these two sweet babies when all along she knew exactly where they were. Ultimately, Susan Smith confessed uh, well, simultaneously, there was an investigation full, going 100 miles an hour, and they discovered the vehicle with the children still inside of it. One final thought on this case, as tragic as it is, and these sweet babies rest in peace here, their mother is up for parole in 2024. I don't know about you, that's something to think about.